beside you and say, Happy New Year. If you haven't told them that already. Happy New Year. And another thing to celebrate. Um, second thing we need to celebrate is today, this weekend, we are eight years old as a church. This is our birthday as a church, and so we need to celebrate eight years old. Um, January 3rd, 2010 was our first public service, and so it's hard to believe that it's been eight years ago, and I look 10 years younger. I don't know how that happens, but I'm kidding. My wife would disagree. Um, but eight years ago, so we have a lot to celebrate in that and, and looking back and reflecting on all that God's done, but also you know, looking ahead at where he's taken us. Um, we're, today is kind of a standalone message, and we're getting ready for something exciting. I want to challenge you to come back the next few weeks. We're going to do a unique series together uh, as we make preparations for 2018 and uh, be prepared to see God do some things in our lives and our church. Um, but as we start a new year, this is typical. Every year we come up with some plans, the things we want to do, right? Our checklist and, 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 and things. And I could ask you, hey, name four areas of your life that, that you want to, to improve. Here's what that would be. If I, was to, if I was to say that, I, I believe that many of us in here, what, what would happen is these four areas, you may get three out of four, but I think we'd get pretty close to all of us getting all four. And it would be this. Number one would be relationships. Man, I want to improve my relationships with my kids and re relationships with my, my spouse, relationships with my friends, right? Relationships would be one. Number two would be finances, right? I want to save some money. I, I want to make preparations for the future. It was funny. Last, last night we were talking and... I'm trying to show Braden how to save money and how he needs to take all this money that he's made and got for Christmas and all of this, and he needs to put it in the bank and allow the interest to draw and make money. So he was in the back of the car when we were driving, and he had his uh, computer out with a calculator on it and was typing up his interest rates and trying to figure it out. And he's like, Dad, I got it figured out. He said, if I put $200 in the bank in 10 years, I'm going to have like 20 grand. I'm like, what? where's the bank? Like, we'll go Monday. Like, where's it at? Like, tell me. And I was like, do What? And, and he was trying to calculate because we were talking about percentages. And I was like, well, look, if you save a million dollars, you're nine years old, about to be 10. If you can save a million dollars, put a million dollars in the bank, off the interest alone, you'll make 60000 a year. You know, you, you'd have a good about amount of money coming in just off of what you have in the bank. And, you know, we was talking about how that would work. Well, if you're 35 years old and you put in about 12000 a year, when you're 65, you know, you have about a million dollars in the bank. But the problem is with inflation, if you do 3% over those 30 years, what happens is in 30 years, you're going to need two and a half million to equate to a million now. And so then you've got to put like 30,000 a year to get there. And you're like, hold on. And, and so we were just blowing his mind. And he's trying to figure all this out. And I'm like, so you got, you know, but look, you're 10. You're not 35. You got, you know, let's start here. And so he was trying to calculate all that. But it, it was it's interesting to get his mind thinking in that way of how to save instead of spend and prepare for the future. But finances is one we always talk about. I, I want to be better financially prepared. What's the next one? Physical, right? You know, man, I've had all these holiday meals. Now it's time to hit the gym. It's trying, time to, to get in shape. I was at the gym this past week talking to somebody and, and every treadmill, everything was taken. There was like nothing available. It's frustrating. And they were like, just come back in February. This place will be emptied out. Like there'll be nobody in here. And, uh, but, but people get, you know, I want to, I want to lose weight. I'm going to do something about it. Another one is spiritually. I need to come to church. I, I need to have my family. It needs to be a priority. I need to be connected to God and, and, and lead my family, right? And so that's one that we talk about. So fill in the blank. What would your blank be this morning? Next year, or this year, rather, this year I hope to what? What would it be? What would it look like for you? This year I hope to pay off my student debt. Some of you are like, yeah, right, i got like 10 more years. You know, this year I hope to improve my marriage. This year I, I hope to overcome this addiction. This year I hope to get healthy. This year, I hope uh, to, to start serving at church. This year, I hope to, to grow spiritually, to be stronger to these temptations that I fall into. Whatever it may be, this year, I hope to, and you fill in the blank for whatever that may be. I, I've never heard anyone with this that have a desire to get worse. Like this year, man, I hope to gain like 40 pounds and just be like overweight and like gain three inches in my waist. And I, you don't hear that, right? 
And like this year, I hope to just blow it in the bank and like, you know, just be like in debt by another 30 grand maybe. I don't know. This year, I just really want to just spend everything I got. Or, or, or this year, I hope to clog my arteries up, you know, and really just, you know, prepare myself for a heart attack. I mean, it, we don't think that way. We always look in, we're looking to improve, not get worse. How can we make ourselves better, not make ourselves worse than we are now? So we always look in to the future. We want things to be better, and so what we look at is I have a hope, right? I have a hope that I can do this. I hope, man, that I can lose 30 pounds. I, I hope that I can save some money. I, I hope that I can get this thing under control with my marriage. I, I hope that, that I can get this relationship with my kids. I hope I can get my kids back on track. And so we all have a hope for all these things, whatever's in your mind, whether it's in any of those four categories, maybe it's an all across the board in all of them. It's just a smorgasbord. It's just all over the place, right? Several things I've got to work on. I'm just messed up. In fact, go ahead and confess it. Look to somebody beside you and say, I'm messed up. Go ahead, tell them. That's the first step. You've got to admit it. But we all have a hope for different things. But hope in and of itself, just hope in and of itself, changes nothing. There's more to it. It's important to have hope. Our hope is found in who? It's found in Jesus, in Him alone, right? But beyond the hope, we've got to have a hope, but then beyond the hope, there's action. There's something that we've got to do. We can have a hope of, of Christ and His return, but our action is we live a surrendered life. We repent of our sins. We follow Him as our Savior. So there's an action that comes behind it. There's a way that we live. There's something that we need to do. Hope is the catalyst, but, but then along with that, there's got to be something that gets done. Something has to take place. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 in New Living Translation says this. says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all of your what? There's that word. Your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. So now that you know better, now that you know Christ, now that things have changed, don't fall back into those things. So we find that word, put your hope. You've got to do something with the hope. You've got to put that hope into obedience. You've got to take actions. You've got to take steps. He says, prepare your minds for action and exercise. Right? There, there's something that goes along with saying, I've got hope that I can do it. But if that's all you say, nothing's going to get done. So you move beyond just saying, I hope I can do it. You, you've got to, to take out, you've got to do something. You've got, you've got to take the next step. It's, it's a discipline, right? It's a discipline in different areas of our life. There's discipline with finances, discipline with our physical bodies. There's discipline in discipleship and our relationships with others and relationship with God. There's a discipline. And, and this isn't my quote, but I want to give you this. This is something I just want you to write down and share. This is, I've heard it this said in, in many different ways, but this is a unique way to say it. So I want to give this to you. This, this, could, this could really help some of us in here as we move forward this year and, and setting you up for what we're going to look at this morning. And so this isn't from me. Choosing what you want most over what you want now is a discipline. Now, we've heard that said in many different ways. But you need to choose what you want most over what you want now. It's a discipline. It's, it's taking the next steps towards what you're looking to do. It's what you want most over what you want now. You say, okay, put that into better terms so I can understand it. Like, give me a, a visual. What I want now may be to play golf three or four times a week in the afternoons when I get off work. But what I want most is a relationship with my kids and for it to be strengthened. What I want now may be to go hunting five days a week in the afternoon, but what I want most, again, is to grow in my relationship with my family. Nothing wrong with golf. Nothing wrong with hunting. You're like, preacher, don't go there this morning. <laughs> nothing wrong with those things, okay? But I want you to see the picture. What I want most versus what I want now. There's a difference. 
What I want now is to be able to spend Monday through Friday every day at lunch eating with coworkers and eating with friends out in the restaurants. But what I want most is to get rid of some of this debt that I have, to get some of that weight off, to be able to live financial freedom. So therefore, it may be taking my lunch or doing something different. What I want now is the number four combo upsized with an extra large fry and a, and a Coke, right? But what I want, that's what I want now, but what I want most is to live another 10 years extra and to be healthy and to be a good example for my family and my kids and to take care of my body. What I want now versus what I want most. A lot of times we lose sight of the vision of what we want most in our family because we get caught up in the now. We get caught up in what I want to see now, the instant gratification, and we lose sight of what's most important. Ultimately, what's most important is our relationship with Christ and that we spend time with him and we grow in our relationship with him. And so in the Old Testament, there's a story about a man by the name of Nehemiah. And I want to set the picture for you for just a moment. Well, we're going to look in the Old Testament and we're going to learn how you put hope into, into doing something with it, not just, not just letting it uh, settle in and, and, and be isolated to itself, but actually put it to life. And number one is this, and, and these are pretty simple principles that go with this. I mean, you may already know these principles. You're going to be like, it's just common sense, but it is. But there again, we lose sight of what's most important because we get caught up in what we want now. But number one is this, is you've got to identify what the problem is. What's your problem? What's my issue? We all have them. You just confessed it a moment ago and told everybody in here you had issues. You've got to be willing to confess and identify the problem. We, we see in Nehemiah's life, he does this, right? He's a Jewish man here. He's in service to the Persian king. He's the cupbearer, to be exact. What's the cupbearer? Basically, when the king would have a glass of wine, he would have to go and taste it first. And if he didn't drop dead, then the king would drink it. But if he dropped dead, then the king would say, okay, i got to get a new cupbearer. I mean, he was there to protect the king. That was his life job was to, to take a hit. If, if somebody was trying to poison the king, the cupbearer would be the one that catches it. And so that's what, his, that's what his duty is. That's what he's there to do. He's a cupbearer to be there to protect the king. And yet he identifies the problem. He, he had some friends that he has this uh, connection with, and he asked them some questions because in Nehemiah chapter 1, what we find after 70 years of exile, the Jews are returning to their homeland. They're returning to their place to be able to establish a home, to establish family in the community in this city there. And so they're making preparations to do that, and Nehemiah had some friends who had just returned home, and so they're there, and, and he asked them, hey, how are things going for you guys? Like, you know, just like maybe you would ask, hey, how was, your, uh, how was your holidays? How was the last couple of weeks? Or maybe you haven't seen anyone. How, how was the past year, man? How's life treated you? He's asking the question to his friends, hey, how's life treating you? Like, what's going on? This is the response, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 3 in the New Living Translation. And they said to me, this was their response, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Now let me give you the significance of this wall that they're talking about. This wall provided protection for their people. This wall provided um, security for the, from the enemies. Without this wall, they were very vulnerable, and they were at risk of being attacked by the enemies around them. And they could be easily attacked at any moment. And Nehemiah just, he didn't hope that things would get better. He looked and, and evaluated, and when he asked the question, what's, how things going, and he realized there was a problem, he begins to identify it. He begins to, to look at the problem and see what was going on, and he identified the problem, and the problem was the wall had been torn down, and there was no protect, protection there for them. Maybe some of you here, you've identified the problem. Maybe every year you go back and you evaluate your life, and you know what the problem is. You, you can pinpoint some of the problems that's going on in your life. That was the case with Nehemiah. They had been in this position for 152 years. This wasn't something recent. They had been vulnerable in a place of attack for 152 years. Somebody needed to do something about it. And, and no doubt, maybe some of you have tried to do something. You've, you've tried to 
change. You've tried to make a difference. You've tried to get healthy. You've tried to do those different things. And maybe you find yourself being unsuccessful with it. Continuing to try to make a change. Maybe in your marriage or maybe with a, a substance abuse problem and you're trying to control it and you, just, and you fall back into it. Whatever that may be for you. Or, or maybe you need to be willing to admit those things that are going on to identify it, whether it's depression, whatever it may be. That the first step is identifying the issue. Maybe for some of you, you've, you've identified that. You've identified the problem. This is the problem. Blank. Whatever it may be. You say, well, I, I, I've got that part, Benji. I know what that is. I've identified it. But here's what happens. As you read Nehemiah and you follow along, you turn the page, and as you're turning the pages reading, you get to a point, Nehemiah looks at them, and, and, and he tells them, hey, you're going to you're gonna have to build a wall. You're going to have to do something about this. You're going to have to change. Something's going to have to change. You, we, we've got to do something different. Write this down. You can't defeat what you haven't identified. My wife does really well with this. She reminds me of this all the time. In fact, we were talking about this the other day. You can't play if you can't identify the win. If you don't know how to identify the win in your life, then you're just going through the motions and you're really just existing. For instance, if... if if you take someone who's never played baseball in their life and you throw them out on the field and you say, all right, go play, go, go live, and they don't know how to win, they don't know how to score, they don't know how to get in position to get around to home, to, to set up, maybe to, to bunt, to move the person to second, to move around or sacrifice fly, whatever it may be, if they don't understand how to win, they're setting themselves up for failure and they're just existing. In your life, if you do not identify the win for your family, what is a win for your kids? What is a win for your spouse? What is a win for you? And if you have not identified the win, you're existing. It's just another way of putting this. You cannot defeat what you have not identified. You cannot overcome that which you've not confessed to yet. To realize there's a problem, right? That's the first step. I mean, in salvation, what's the first step when we surrender our, our life, when, when God's convicted us of our sins and we know that there's something there we need to change? What's the first step? It's admitting what? I'm a sinner, right? It's realizing the problem. That's the first step. As we move into 2018, you've got to identify the problem. If you want to defeat it, you first have got to will, be willing to admit it. Once you admit it, then you've got to put a plan together. What did Nehemiah say? He says, hey, we must build the wall. He, he looks at him and identifies the problem. He says, the problem is 152 years, boom, there's no wall, there's no protection. You're just there vulnerable to the enemy. Why, why are we just sitting around? Something's got to happen. Look to somebody beside you. Tell them, you've got to turn the page. Tell them, you've got to turn the page. You got to, to move forward. I, hey, I'm going to attend church more consistently. I'm going to make it a priority. I'm going to commit to grow closer to God. I'm going to commit to get healthy. I need accountability with the internet. I need accountability with my finances. What, whatever it may be, you got to be willing to identify and then turn the page and say, hey, last year was a different story. This year, I'm, it's a new page, it's a new chapter, it's a new way. I'm identifying it. I'm going to do something about it. You know, because here's the, here's the issue. When you get caught up in a life and there's pain and there's instability and there's issues and, and it's, it's a unstable ground and it's rocky for so long, you get comfortable there. And you settle in and think, well, this is how life's going to be. This is how the rest of my life is going to look. And you don't realize that you're in great trouble in ruins. And here's the issue with that. That means the walls in your life are broken down and you're vulnerable for attack. And you're vulnerable and you're at risk of being defeated. You've got to identify it and then start building the wall of protection around whatever area. Building the wall of protection around your health. Building the wall of protection around your finances. You've got to build protection for your family. Whatever that may look like for you, you've got to realize that the walls are broken in your life and there's areas you've got to rebuild them and stop complaining about it and do something about it and, and to be encouraged in the place you may say, well, man, I've got a lot of walls down. 
to be encouraged by that, to understand that, but just in the, in the places of our biggest problems, we can show God and he'll show us the greatest story. And that God can work in our, our greatest problems. So number one is what? You've got to identify the what? The problem, right? Number two is this. A lot of us bypass number two, by the way. We'll get to number three in a minute, but a lot of us, especially us guys, we, we identify a problem, and what's our next step? We want to what? Fix it, right? And sometimes your spouse don't want to hear that. They're like, well, here's, the, you know, well, here's your problem. It's what you need to do. I, I don't want you to tell me how to fix it. I just want you to listen, right? So we identify the problem, and we want to move directly into fixing it. I fall into that category a lot of times. I have to check myself. Number two, if we're not careful, we'll bypass. So identify the problem. Number two is this, to pray and seek God. You've you got to stop here. You, you can't just move forward and take action immediately. You've got to pray and seek God. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did, right? Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4, when he heard about what was going on, when he heard about the issues that were taking place, the Scripture says that in verse 4 that he sat down and he wept. In fact, for days, he says he mourned, broken. Then he fasted. And he prayed to the God of heaven. And so before he took action, before he went moving, he, he t- took some time to pray and to fast and to seek God and to get wisdom and to, to get counsel. So identify the problem, and then he starts to seek God. And any time you have a vision to do something, you're going to need help from God to see it accomplished. And, and Nehemiah starts to pray, and he fasts. And then he goes to the king, and he says, Can I have permission to go do this? And of course... Uh, he has favor granted, and he goes there to, to help them to be able to start uh, the process. Now, it would have been easy for Nehemiah to go, when they told him the story, for him to go, man, that's terrible. And then for him to go on Facebook and write this long post about how terrible it is and complaining about the problem, and then go on with his life. It would have been easy just to complain. He wasn't a builder. He wasn't a professional contractor. He was a cupbearer. And so that's what he did. But yet he was willing to take action. He could have had every doubt flood his mind in those moments. I have no business trying to help build this wall. I have no business trying to tell them what to do. I don't even know what I'm doing. Many of us have felt like that many times in our life. Not qualified. Not able to relate to that because I don't know anything about it. And maybe some of you can relate, and you start thinking, well, man, if I start this, I might fail, and then people will think I'm a failure, so I'm not going to start. I know I need to lose 50 pounds, but if I start it and then I fail, people are going to say I'm a failure, and I, so I just won't start it. I'm, gone, I'm too far gone. And then you quit. Or I, I need to save. I need to do something. I need to set up for retirement. I need to, I need to stop spending everything I make. And, and then you look at it, and you say, well, I'm too far gone. I'll I'll leave this earth with that. I just need to just forget about it and keep doing what I'm doing. And as a result, you you miss out on those opportunities of what God wants to do. I'm not qualified to do that. I don't have what it takes. And that's exactly why it's imperative to seek God first, because you don't have what it takes. But with God, all things are possible. And God wants to do the impossible through you. And he wants to use you. Because God doesn't always call the equipped, but a lot of times it's the fact that he equips the called. He equips you along the way and, and makes preparation. So let me ask you a question. What is the one change you could make today to get started on that fill in the blank? This year, I hope to. What is one step? You may say, there's no way I could save $12,000 a year to go towards a 30-year plan to get me to a million dollars in retirement. There's no way. Where do you start? Are you putting $10 a week away? $20? Whatever it may be, have you started somewhere? Have you made a plan? Have you, have you done anything? Well, I, I, I know, I'm so, I, I know I'm, I'm so overweight. I know, I know that my body's not healthy. I know, that my, I know those things are there. What, have you, what's the first step? Maybe instead of drinking 10 Cokes a day, you drop it down to like five, right? I mean, start somewhere. Don't say you can't. And you can't on your own. But God calls us to first have a relationship with him and then with other people 
Find people who are successful at those things. Find people who are financial advisors. Find people who are physically fit. Find some of these guys in here to do those things. How did you do that? How can you help me? And not just sit around and say, I can't. But to identify the problem and then seek God, seek counsel, get wisdom, and then get a plan in place and look through what you're able to do. And what could you do for the kingdom of God if you were physically healthier? It may be going on a mission trip up in the mountains somewhere overseas. What could you do financially for the kingdom of God if you were debt-free? What, what can you do with your life if, if you were in a different place for your family? And we need to realize God's given us everything we need and everything he wants us with everything he wants us to do with what we already have. When we surrender our heart and we surrender our, our lives to him. So the last one is this, right? It's identifying the problem and then it's seeking God. And, and getting a plan together, seeking wisdom, get counsel. And then once you get wisdom and you get counsel and you get a plan and you sit down, and then the third one is this, is you just get busy and go to work. Look at somebody beside you and say, get off the couch. Go ahead, tell them, get off the couch with your finances. Get off the couch with your relationships. Get off the couch with whatever area of your life you're struggling with. Stop saying you can't. And let this be a year that, that you don't make a, a New Year's resolution that's going to be dead in three weeks. But you turn the page in your life and realize this year I'm going to focus on what's most important, not what I want now. And putting what's most ahead of what's now. Most of us end up putting what we want now ahead of what we want most. And we're not willing to identify the things that we want most. Even though in our heart, that's what we really want. In our heart, we want a good marriage. We want a good relationship with our kids. We want those things. But we get caught up with the now, and we lose vision of what's most. And so to identify and then get busy and go to work. And that's what Nehemiah did. He shows up. He gathers the leaders of Jerusalem. He pulls them all together. And there's priests, and there's all these people that, that are there. They're not... They're officials, they're, they're not builders, they're, they're not contractors. He pulls them all together, and here's what he says, verse 17 and 18 of chapter 2 in the New Living Translation. He says, you know very well the trouble that we are in. He says, you've got to identify the problem. Most of you have identified the problem. We're in trouble. Right? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So then he puts a plan together. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. What about you? Let's rebuild this wall in our finances and end this disgrace or in our health or whatever it may be for you. Let's put a plan together. And then verse 18, then I told them about how the gracious hand of God has been on me. Like, I can't do this on my own, but God's hand on me, we can make this happen with our marriage. We can make this happen with our family. And he shared the story, and then the response was, they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. And so what did they do? They began the what? The good work. So the good work is this. The good work is the fact that you're getting busy. But the, the great news is the fact that you're not alone, that God's with you, and that you've got others along the journey with you. And don't think for a minute when you get started that you're not going to face opposition you're going to face opposition pretty quick. I mean, the moment you decide that you want to get financially fit, it's going to be the moment that you're enticed to buy something. The moment you decide to get healthy, it's going to be the moment that something else is going to come up. And you're going to be faced with opposition. You're going to be faced with people telling you you can't do it. There's going to be people telling you you have no business trying that. And they're going to try to distract you from doing what you know that you need to do because you're more concerned with what's most important while those around you may still be focused on what's important now. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into that trap. Nehemiah, in chapter 6, what's happening is they're rebuilding the wall and they're having success and things are going on. These guys come along and, and they're the enemy trying to distract them. They're like, hey, can you come down and talk to us for a minute? And he's like, no, I can't come down. They're like, no. And they go telling him about all these issues and all these problems and they're complaining and they're doing everything they can to bring him down off the wall to distract him from doing what's most important to focus in on what's going on right now. And he says, I don't have time to do that. And over and over they continue to try to distract him, but he stays focused and in chapter 6, verse 3, here's his response. He's like, I can't come down. He says, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. And he was telling them, I can't come down 
and focus on all the complaints or all the issues or all the things that you're trying to distract me with because I'm more concerned with what's most important, not this thing now. And if we're not careful, we'll have those moments in our life where others will come around and try to distract us from what's most important to focus on the now. And if we're not careful, we'll get caught right back in the flesh of, of trying to satisfy those now desires, and we lose sight of what's most important, the, the long time, right? The bigger picture that we need to be concerned with, building walls to protect and to, to prepare our families for the future. And Satan's going to do everything he can to try to distract you. And I want to tell you, don't come down off the wall. Because if you're not careful in three weeks, you're going to get distracted and you'll come down off the wall. And you'll get caught back up in the things that you were once in and you'll lose sight. And I can't help but think that as you look at that picture, I'm sure he had some people on both sides. I'm sure there were some up there going, hey, you need to go check on that. That, that's, that sounds, you may need to go look at that. And he's like, no, no, I can't come down off this wall. We've got to build it. This is, the, this is the big picture here. And you can imagine others saying, Nehemiah, don't leave us. Stay right here with us. You stay in it. We're going to finish this thing. It's going to happen. Don't go down there and get caught up. And you need those people around you. You need some people who believe in you. You need people who speak life into you. You need people who help you to lose the weight you want to lose, to, to get financially fit, to, to build your relationship with your spouse. You need to find someone who has a healthy relationship with their spouse. You find people who God's using in that area and, and help identify and, and, and for them to help you along the way. But whatever those things are, you need to shake them off and turn to the new page and allow God to work. And here's the unique story. That wall was broken for 152 years. Nehemiah comes along, identifies the problem. Once he does that, then he seeks God. He gets wisdom, direction, and a plan. And then he gets busy. And as a result, 52 days later, the wall was built. 52 days from 152 years. What was the problem? One, perhaps for a while, nobody would really even identify the problem was there. But once they did, they probably said, well, nobody can do anything about it. There's nothing can be done. And as a result, they lived in that bondage for so long until someone finally stood up and said, something has to be done to get rid of this disgrace. When will we stand up in our families and say, something's got to be done to keep us from ruins? Something's got to be done to protect our family. Something has to be done, and I want to be focused on what's most important, not just what's going on now, because there's so much more to life than that. And God did exceedingly and abundantly more than they could have ever imagined that was possible. Why? Because they were obedient. You may want to write this down. What God wants to do through you, what God wants to do through you will be limited. You say, hold on, God's work's limited? Listen to me. For what God wants to do through you will be limited by the work that you're unwilling to do. What God wants to do through your life will be limited by what you're unwilling to do. By the fact that you're not willing to take those steps. That you're not willing to, to, to be disciplined. That you're not willing to focus on what's most important over what you want now. But you've got to take the hope that you have and you have to do something with it. And so don't be limited by your willing to not do anything. Willingness to just sit back, but to take action and, and to do something. So what are the tangible steps you need to take? Do you need accountability? Get it. Do you need a mentor or a trainer? Get it. What do you need? Do you need a life group? Absolutely. Get it. Do you need people that will speak life into you, that will be honest with you? Get it. I'll never forget, I, I was having some health issues and, and, and was sharing that with someone, and, and they were just honest. They said, do you want an honest opinion? You need to lose weight. And I was like, ah, wow. But for someone to be honest with you, to be transparent, because they're more concerned about what's most important in your life, just not what now. And you need that. So Nehemiah builds the wall, and he wasn't doing it alone. One, he had God, and two, he had others, and you need the same. First and foremost, you need God on your side. Number two is you need to enlist others to help you along the way. So going back to that question, this year I hope to what? And I want you to know God's behind you. 
This church is behind you. Find people to get connected. We have a lot of people that are successful in all of those areas that I mentioned. From health to finances to relationships to marriages. There's people that are good in those areas that, that are, are very well. They've got good walls of protection built around those areas. And maybe you need to, to look into that and say, God, how can, how can we strengthen those areas in our life and build those walls? Identify it, seek God, and get busy. With every head bowed, I'm going to pray for you. And, and, and what's most important, first and foremost, is this. Uh, uh, above, you know, yes, it's important to take care of your body on this earth. But also, yes, our body is going to deteriorate. So what's more important than even our health of here? It's, it's our spiritual health. It's do we have a relationship with Christ? Where will we spend eternity? Most important decision we can ask, the question we can ask is where will I spend eternity? Do I have a relationship with Jesus? Have I been forgiven of my sins? That's the first step. Identifying the problem. I'm a sinner. I need Christ in my life. I need, to, I need to be saved. That's the first step. And then the others are important too. Taking care of your body. Your body is a temple. God's given you that. You need to take care of it. God lives in you, the Spirit. You need to take care of the temple. You need to take care of your finances. You need to be disciplined in those areas. Be good stewards. But it starts with surrender. And identifying that. With every head bowed, if you say, hey, Pastor Benji, I, I got a lot of things to work on. But if you're here right now and you say, but the first thing I need to do above all else is I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Above all the other mess, above all the other things, above all the other issues, first and foremost, I've got to surrender and repent of my sins and confess Jesus as Lord. And that's the decision I need to make today, and I feel like God's working in my heart right now, and he's pursuing me, and I, it's strong, and I know I need to do it. Maybe it's your first time here. It could be your 20th time here, but it's in the moment right now. You said, that's me. I, I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come right here, but I just want to ask you to, no one's looking around, just to raise your hand in a moment and say, that's me. Pray for me. I need to give my life to Jesus. Starts right here. If that's you, one, two, three. Hands are going up already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the middle, I see your hands on the left. Thank you. I see your hand, young man. Thank you. I see your hand. Any others? Thank you. Thank you for raising your hand. 